Hello everybody, in this video we're going to be covering section 14.1, Bronsted Lauer Acids and Bases. We've got quite a few learning objectives this week in this section. We're going to identify acids, bases, and conjugate acid-base pairs according to Bronsted Lowry's definition. We're going to write equations for acid and base ionization reactions. We're going to use the ion product constant for water to calculate hydronium and hydroxide ion concentrations. And we're going to describe the acid-base behavior of amphiprotic substances. So I want to get into the history a little bit of acid-base theory and see why this is so important in chemistry. It's really an old thing that we've been studying for quite a while. Um, and it's also very important for, like, biochemistry in particular. Uh, so it started in 1680 when a guy by the name of Robert Boyle started to kind of characterize some things that he called acids. He saw that they had the ability to dissolve many substances. They could change the colors of certain natural dyes, which we've used to our advantage now. We're going to learn about that. Um, and that they lose these traits after coming in contact with alkali base solutions. Um, so we kind of get this duality where acids and bases start to react. And we're going to learn about what that means in a little bit, too. In the 18th century, it was recognized that acids, they have a sour taste. They react with limestone to liberate gases substances. So limestone is a type of base. And they interact with alkalis to form neutral substances. Then in 1815, Humphrey David contributed greatly to the development of many modern uh, acid-base concepts where he started to recognize that hydrogen is essential, to the is, is essential to acids. He started to figure out something's happening with hydrogen here. Then Joseph Louis uh, Gay-Lussac uh, concluded that acids are substances that can neutralize bases and that these two classes of substances can be defined only in terms of one another. So... There's the acids and the bases. Then in 1884, we start to really make some headway with this by the guy by the name of Arrhenius. And he defined an acid as a compound that dissolves water to yield the hydrogen cations, and a base is a compound that dissolves in water to yield hydroxy anions. So this is the typical acid-base theory that we've been dealing with so far. Acids uh, give us hydrogen cations, and bases uh, give us some sort of hydroxide. But we're going to go a little further, okay? And we're going to start talking about uh, Jonas Bronsted and Thomas Lowry. Now, they kind of expanded and generalized that theory. They proposed that, it, that the theory should be based solely on the transfer of hydrogen uh, ions. Um, these H pluses here often just call protons because if you think of the most common isotope of hydrogen it, it would just be a proton and an electron you take away that electron to produce a cation and all you're left with is a proton and under their theory a compound that donates a proton to another compound is an acid a compound that accepts a proton is a base all right an acid-base reaction is the transfer of a proton from a donor acid to an acceptor base. So it's the only thing that's required in a Bronsted-Lowry definition uh, to be a base is to be able to accept a proton. You don't necessarily have to have uh, hydroxide to be a base in this uh, definition. So let's talk a little bit about conjugate pairs. Okay. So when an acid donates a proton, the species that remains is called the conjugate base of the acid, okay? So if that species was able to donate a proton initially, it should be able to accept a proton back. Whatever is left should be able to take that proton back. Um, that means that it can act as a proton acceptor in the reverse reaction. When a base accepts a proton, it's converted to its conjugate acid. So let's take a look at this example down here. So we have water, all right, and we have ammonia. During this reaction, water is going to give up a proton, all right, and ammonia is going to accept that proton, okay? So if you pair these off, we have water starting here. It gives its proton to the base. It becomes hydroxide, okay? So this is the conjugate base to this initial acid. 
the ammonia accepts that proton and becomes the ammonium ion. This is the conjugate acid of this base. Uh, let's talk about what an acid ionization reaction is. And this is important because acids and bases only make sense in the context of water. Okay, these reactions only happen in water. The reaction between a bronze lauryl acid and water is called acid ionization. So in our case here, we have HF. It's going to give a proton over to water, which is now acting as a base, to form the hydronium ion and a free uh, fluoride ion. Now, this is very important. We never actually have free protons in a solution, okay, when we're talking about acids and bases, because there's always water present as the solvent, and it's always going to accept that proton to form this hydronium ion, okay? So what we're really forming is hydronium ions. We don't just have free protons in the solution. Base ionization of a species occurs when it accepts protons from water molecules. So now water is going to give a proton rather than accept it to this base. This is pyridine. It's uh, this super stinky stuff that they get. It smells like concentrated hot garbage stink. And they uh, originally isolated it from uh, distilling rotten meat. Um, it's really useful in organic chemistry. It's great stuff. Um, so it accepts that proton and it forms hydroxide and the uh, pyridinium acid. So as we've seen uh, in these two examples here where water can both give a proton and accept a proton, some species are capable of either donating or accepting protons. These are called amphiprotic, uh, or more generally amphoteric, where uh, we don't necessarily have the transfer of protons. And we'll talk about what that means in a little bit, but we have some exotic examples later. One of those is the bicarbonate ion. Um, you can see that if we start here with the bicarbonate ion, it can, ex it can give a proton to water and become the carbonate ion, or it can accept a proton from water and become uh, carbonic acid here. Now, it's important to note that when bicarbonate is added to water, both of these equilibriums are established just to different degrees, depending on the K values for these reactions. Um, so if a uh, molecule is amphiprotic, it makes sense that it can react with itself, all right? Uh, and the classic example of this is with water, where one water molecule acts as a acid, the other as a base, and it dissociates out into a hydronium and a hydroxide ion. This process is called auto-ionization. And the extent of water auto-ionization um, is reflected by something called the ion product uh, constant for water, the KW, so the K value for this reaction. This K value is going to become very important to us, all right? Uh, as we've learned already, equilibrium constants are dependent upon temperature, okay? At 25 degrees, the KW for water is 1 times 10 to the negative 14. This is going to be an important number for us later. We're going to need to have that in our back pocket. The process is endothermic, meaning that it's going to increase, KW is going to increase as we increase the temperature. So at 100 degrees, the KW value is quite a bit higher, right? 13 orders of magnitude higher. Okay. Now, it is the other thing that's important to realize if we look at this is that this is going to follow the same rules that we had before where we're not going to be using uh, the liquid in our K value okay so KW is just the product of the hydronium ion concentration and the hydroxide ion concentration and this is why this is going to be so powerful to us later it's because if we know the KW for a specific temperature and we do we know it for pretty much all the temperatures 
um, then we can look up the KW and then if we know one of these values we can use this relationship to find the other one. 